All right. So good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Crystal Hall with the Iowa After School Alliance. I want to thank you for joining this presentation today. We are very excited to have our presenters. I want to take care of a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. As I just mentioned, we are recording this video. Uh, we ask that if you haven't already, please mute yourself. It just kind of helps cut down on those background noises and accidental dog barks and things of that nature. Um, we're a small group today, so if you are, you are able to log in or connect with video, we would ask that you do so because we will have some discussion points that will be happening today throughout our presentation as well. Uh, if video is not an option for you, that is absolutely fine. Um, we would imagine that this presentation will probably bring up a lot of questions. And because we're a little bit constricted by time today, we're going to try something fairly new, uh, which is to say that we would like you to type any or all of your questions into the chat box. What we'll be using that chat box script for then is uh, post presentation, I will be sending those to our presenters today who will have some time to be able to answer your questions more fully. I'll then make that transcript available to everybody through an email and of course we'll post it on our website as well. So um, unless there's any questions, we'll go ahead and get started with some introductions. So. Again, thank you for joining uh, our presentation today, which is called Make It Okay. Dr. Mona McCallie Witters provides seasoned leadership as the Executive Director of the National Alliance on Mental Illness in Lynn County, uh, which can be abbreviated as NAMI LC. Dr. McCauley Witters brings passion, expertise, and a 35-year career in mental health services as a licensed psychologist. She seeks to catalyze change, reduce stigma, advocate and increase awareness about mental illness. She was born in Cedar Rapids and completed her graduate education as a psychologist at the University of Iowa. She lives in Cedar Rapids where she is at the forefront of mental health initiatives in the Lynn County community. And we wanna thank her for joining us today. Additionally, we have Tanner Sather with us today. So Tanner is a marketing intern at the National Alliance on Mental Health Illness in Lynn County, again, NAMI. Uh, Tanner is broadening his educational experiences in nonprofit organizations. And currently, he is a college senior at Mount Mercy University, Go Mustangs, where he is finishing his undergraduate degree in marketing. He'll, uh, he has a December 2020 graduation date. So thank you uh, for that. And at this point, I'll turn it over to our presenters. All right, good morning. I hope you have your coffee or your water handy. And we are very grateful for Crystal and all of you spending your time this morning to hear about making mental health okay. It's something that both Tanner and I are very passionate about. And I feel that during this time, uncertain time with COVID and schools and virtual learning and you know, all the things that we're struggling with and juggling, it's a timely talk. So we'd really like you to think about your world, your community as we go through the slides. And, you know, if anything resonates with you, uh, you know, in the chat box, say, you know, that's great. You know, I, I know exactly, I've been there, done that. Um, Crystal's going to kind of monitor that, and I also will be peeking at it. And then, as um, Crystal earlier mentioned, we'll circle back to the questions that will come up. And I know we'll be giving you a lot of material, so we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to kind of do the bulk of things, and then Tanner's going to talk about things from his eyes and his shoes as he's walking through going back to school, having the pandemic stop school, all of the things that are going on that he's experienced and just kind of sharing with you as a peer about helpful ways to cope with all of, all of this uncertainty. So we'll get going here and Tanner, I'll go to the next slide. 
So yeah, you already heard about who we are. The only thing is, um, I'm a new grandma. So my, my heart and soul goes out to educators and teachers and all of you at the forefront in working with our children. You guys as site members, teachers, principals, you know, really are at the front door in helping families and children cope. So, um, you know, all of those things are so important for us. As Crystal said, Tanner and I are both from NAMI, Lynn County. And I, you know, if you could just quickly in your chat box say, yay, you've heard of NAMI, you know all about us, or nay, you know, you're not really sure what, what NAMI is all about. So if you get a chance, I'll just give you all a minute to kind of let us know if you've ever heard of us before. That's kind of my psychological testing question to you. So some people aren't sure, some people haven't heard of us and I appreciate your honesty. No, 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 no. <laughs> so I, I get that all the time. Usually I have maybe one person. Oh, somebody from Northeast Iowa. Okay, yay, one out of like 10. So, that happens to us a lot when I go out into the community. And uh, as a nonprofit, NAMI stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And we are, Tanner and I, are the Lynn County chapter. And they've just hired me. I took off my psychologist hat and now I'm wearing my NAMI hat. What we do are, or what the NAMI people do is, we do have a walk, as Jenny alluded to, to raise money for our programs. And Tanner, if you could go to the next slide, that talks about our mission is mental health, to make all Iowans who are affected by mental health the best that they can be. So we do a lot of public initiatives, such as the Make It Okay, um, we do educational programs. We go out in the community and we talk at colleges. Our real rock star programs are our support groups and our classes. These go across all the chapters in Iowa for NAMI. So if you're not from Lynn County, like if you're from Northeast Iowa, there's probably a chapter somewhere. I think there's like maybe 13 chapters across the state and some, the programs that we offer here in Lynn County will also be probably offered in your county. But we do things for family support. We are our virtual support classes. We also have family to family classes where we're teaching families that are struggling with, let's say, a, a family member that has mental illness, um, advocacy. And really our big passion is stopping stigma for people with mental illness, because we know that stigma harms people and especially with mental illness. And we'll, we'll be talking more about that as we get in to make it okay. So uh, we're always looking for volunteers and people who are interested in helping spread awareness about mental illness. And we need mental health ambassadors in every community. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you watch this video. Next slide. So we know that together as a group, this opportunity will help you understand the importance of making mental health number one. Right now with COVID and the pandemic, we're wrestling with so many things. And we know that there's more anxiety, more uncertainty, economic challenges, and kind of in layman's terms, people are freaking out. They, you know, with school and what's going to happen and how are you going to do it? So you are at the front steps or so to speak, the front doors 
in your centers, dealing with the parents and the significant others and the caregivers and the children. So your understanding and sensitivity towards making it okay to not be okay. And I know that's kind of a twisted saying, but it's really okay right now. Um, I can assure you as a psychologist, and I just talked to Crystal, that I too am anxious and uncertain about what's in store. So for example, I have a new baby granddaughter and her childcare fell through because her uh, childcare provider discovered she's going to have to virtually teach her children at home. And there was this big domino effect. So I'm being called in as a grandma to provide care for an infant. And I'm very happy to do that, but I can't fathom all the juggling that's going on at your sites with your families and the people that you provide services to. So we're, we're grateful that you're listening today on learning about how to make it okay. Go ahead, Tanner. So make it okay is based on a statewide initiative. And there's plenty of data that was collected by the public health agencies looking into what are the needs listed by all 99 counties. And we know from data collected in 2016 and 2018 that in the state of Iowa, 86 out of 99 counties said mental health was their top concern. In 2018, 98 of those counties said mental health, definitely. So we're fortunate here to know to make Iowans healthy by using the Make It Okay campaign. This opportunity is to help develop conversations to reduce the stigma of mental illness. That's what we're all about and why we're all here today. So thank you for listening. And we're, we'll go on to the next slide. If you can, Tanner, can you advance it? Or are we frozen? <laughs> yeah, so what, what we're seeing and what we're looking at is the, a group called the Healthiest State Initiative for Iowa. It's a nonprofit organization. It's to help the public pro, through a private partnership make Iowans the healthiest state in the nation. And it's a holistic program looking at the physical, social, emotional, and the most um, together teaming up across all 99 counties to make Iowans healthy. So next slide. As part of this group, we are getting support and funding because everybody always wants to know who's behind everything. So we have a, a variety of sponsors, Unity Point, United Way, some really top-notch people believe in what we're doing and understand the importance of make it okay. And we're thrilled that we can offer these presentations at no charge to you and train mental health ambassadors. It's a two hour training. And if you're interested at the end, you could be a make it okay ambassador in your county or in your community. And we are always looking for such passionate people. So let's keep going here. Um, what is make it okay? It's the campaign that focuses on stomping out stigma in your community. We're also focusing on helping you learn and teaching others on how to have conversations about mental illness. We understand that stigma is a difficult topic, especially in regards to getting people to talk about mental illness. And as a psychologist, we know that talking is so crucial. If you're hiding things, it takes a lot of energy and it's hurtful and it prevents treatment and it just backfires. So uh, 
you keep keep going tanner so we're going to do a, a video here go ahead see if you can get it started it's a really good introduction Seem to having troubles, Mona. Trying to start it. All right. If you wanted to. The videos sometimes are not the smoothest, so we'll we'll give Tanner another minute or two. This particular video really let me see really talks about it has a big empty bubble in a coffee shop, and there's two people that are having coffee and the speaker asks one of them with a coffee cup says you know how are you here we go it was, it'll look like this for the videos thank you hey hey how's it going good so uh, how was your weekend uh it's good how about you yeah how's it going meh what's that what is meh mean well, with depression, uh, some days are good days and some days are bad days. And yesterday was not one of my good days. Silence. It makes the mental illness stigma even worse. Do you want to talk about it? Learn what to say at makeitokay.org. So you can see, and I'm sure, you know, you're all kind of thinking about, hmm, can you see yourself in that? particular video and which one would you be which person kind of comes to mind and and that big empty talk bubble is the silence that happens sometimes when someone has mental illness they feel alone they feel isolated and especially during this pandemic they're even more isolated and kind of captured at home trying to stay safe and not certain about the way the world is. So these types of videos and testimonials can be found on the Make It Okay website because we know it doesn't just happen once, it happens multiple times in your community and my community. So we're trying to stop that silence and help you learn how to have those conversations and encourage people and teach people in your sites to to start those conversations to support each other and know that you're not alone go ahead tanner next slide so while it may seem overwhelming task there are three things that each of us can do to start talking and that's learning learning about stigma and mental illness and and then going to talking to practice tips for asking people are you okay and learning about what to say and what not to say it's much like if someone had diabetes you, you know you'd ask them how are they doing what's their blood sugar you know how's it been going, you know, and you would have those conversations. So it's the same idea when you see people struggling and you, you know on your radar that something's not right. And so having that conversation. So I, I really want you to practice and imagine you were the person who felt alone and isolated and maybe you have some of your own mental health issues so you know how important it is to be able to so to speak get it off your chest to someone who's really willing to listen and that's what make it okay is about is learning talking and sharing conversations about mental illness to help each other next one Okay, so we know that for people, stigma causes problems. It's harmful in regards to mental illness. And that's really why you're listening today to try to figure out what can I do in my world and in my community. So what I'd like you to do now is just kind of imagine 
and think about how mental illnesses are portrayed in our society, whether it's in the newspaper or on TV, what kinds of images, if you had to think in your mind, come up? And you can go ahead and type them on your list and that would be you know, in your chat box. What, what's the first thought that comes to mind about mental illness? Yep, crazy, broken, sure, violent shooters in our community, they're mentally ill, you know, supposedly, even though the statistics show no, they're not. Um, less than 3% of the shooters have serious mental illness. So that leaves 97% that aren't. They are morally and criminally uh, so, so to speak, deficient, but it doesn't mean that they're mentally ill. And you're right, I love that box. That's the challenge. Sure, if you think of mental illness, you think of someone lazy, not functioning, not working, you know, those are all very negative stereotypes that are harmful because sure, you know, they're not lazy and they're not shut down. It's a brain disorder and their brain's not functioning properly. So we're all, you know, we're all bombarded by these negative stereotypes about mental illness. So let's go to the next slide. So mental illness is something that's very different from pulling yourself up by the bootstraps because it is a, metal, a medical condition. It's not, stress can affect it, but it's not a lack of willpower and it's not a weakness. So many people feel that, wow, if, you know, if I'm depressed, it's, it's because I'm weak or something's, you know, a character flaw. No, no. We know that it is a brain disorder and a very complicated brain disorder. So we understand that there's a lot of stigma and we're out here today and joining with you to stomp that stigma and break down these stereotypes and encourage these conversations. So next slide, Tanner, please. And we kind of hit on this before when we were discussing the common images and you come up, you came up with some really powerful images that are painful and propagated in, in our society. And these labels become damaging to people with mental illness. Like, you know, I've heard people say, oh, you know, I feel so bipolar today. And I'm like, don't say that. You are not bipolar. That's a that those terms are powerful and negative and really harmful to us all. So I really try to um, break down those stereotypes because they're the furthest thing from the truth. And the images leave a lasting impression in our minds. So, you know, a lot of the sensational journalism that's out there, it's there not to help people, but to actually get better ratings. And that is why these descriptions come so quickly to our minds because the mass media keeps sending us those images, but we all know that those images could not be farther from the truth. So we'll, we'll go to the next one, please. And this, this one looks at some of the reality from the movie stars that are trying to break down these images. These are celebrities that we know and trust. For example, Kevin Love, he's the basketball player that had a panic disorder during a playoff game and had to leave the game and get treatment and now is a spokesperson. You can see, so mental illness, it doesn't discriminate. 
it affects movie stars, basketball players, singers, our families, maybe even at different points in our own lives ourselves. So we know that mental illness is common. And if you think about your centers and your sites and the families that you're working with, the reality is it's an equal opportunity disease, disorder. And there probably are at least one out of five of the families that you're working with or the students who have someone in their family that has mental illness. It's a very common um, disorder. So we're all in this together and trying to keep us all as healthy as we can. So we'll go to the next slide. And as I said before, it's common. One out of five people experience mental illness. And in fact, I love this one with the little beetle car. It's common. In fact, they the, the image they wanna portray, it's as common as silver cars. And you know how many there are in the parking lot if you have a silver car and you try to find your car. So putting this all together, if you compare mental illness, one out of five, okay, keep that statistic in your mind, and you compare it to diabetes, diabetes is one out of eight people. And yet how we talk about and how we perceive diabetes is so different than mental illness. So we know that, um, you know, that's why we're here today. We're learning and talking about and stopping the stigma and, and really helping each other and the people that we love that may be dealing with mental health challenges. So we'll go to the next slide and you'll probably have to hit the button. Okay, stay on that one, Tanner, and be ready. So again, if you think about the images in your own mind about let's say a medical condition like diabetes or heart disorder or cancer, what terms come to mind? Can you type in your box? If you, you know someone that has heart disease, how would you describe uh, someone experiencing cancer or heart disease? Under stress, yeah. Sure, there they've got some stress, so that they have that common. There we go. So we're coming up with strong. If you have cancer, you're a fighter. You know, you've probably been to breast cancer walks or different events supporting people with cancer. You may be wearing a T-shirt that says, you know, cancer fighter, or you, I walk for lymphoma. You know, a warrior. That's right but you don't think about those terms for someone with mental illness. And go to the next button, I mean, hit it, Tanner, and there'll be a new bubble. Yeah, so we, you've given me some of the terms, things like lazy, out of control, a shooter, and those are so different from how you describe someone experiencing cancer a warrior. So those are very strong words and, and very different. So we have a lot of work to do here in regards to mental health and being Iowans with mental health healthy. So we'll go to the next slide. I've done this, came up on my phone. Oh. Okay. So we're taught as children about illness like colds and broken bones. Mental illness is just not discussed. It's hidden, it's in the back corner, and it actually is the way we used to approach cancer. Like we, we'd whisper about it. This was probably before most of your times, but in the 80s, like we kind of thought cancer was contagious, but now we know absolutely not. And it's the same thing about mental illness. It is a normal illness, it's a part of the body. So, we are really working hard because we know there's a lot of work to do in regards to mental illness and making it okay. Uh, so we want it to be seen as normal. And, and go to the next slide. 
we know that stigma hurts. It makes barriers. It keeps people from getting treatment, maybe even dropping out of school or not performing as well at school, quitting their jobs early. We know that the jails sometimes and frequently end up housing people with mental illness when they unfairly are put in the jail and not sent to the hospital. It isolates people and even makes like such alone and hopelessness that people have feelings of suicide. So it's really important to think about getting people treatment and helping them avoid going down such a bumpy road. It's not necessary. Go on, Tanner. So this is a little more personal coming back to you in your lives and your community. And you, you don't have to answer, but I, I want you to think about someone that you know, maybe a loved one, a family member, or yourself who suffered from mental illness. Because we know, if you remember, one out of five have mental, have experienced a mental illness. So in some way, I bet each, almost each and every one of you know someone that are struggling and it could even be yourself. And there's, there's nothing, it's not a character flaw and it's not a weakness, it's a brain disorder. We'll go to the next slide and we're probably gonna have to speed it up a little bit here. So we have a quiz and we're, we're not going to do the quiz today, but the important thing is for you to think a little bit about where are you on this arrow of, in terms of comfortable helping a person with physical illness than helping someone with a mental illness. Do you agree or do you disagree? And we'll go to the next quiz. I'm a psychologist, I love quizzes, so yeah. So on this one, whereas the previous one focused on others, we're gonna ask you a tougher question. Is it okay for other people who experience mental illness but not yourself? If you experienced it or have experienced it, do you, where do you see yourself on this continuum? Do you agree that, that you're weak or potentially you could be weak and you, you're struggling or, or, or do you just disagree completely outright? And the next slide, we'll, we'll kind of keep moving along here. So this is looking at our communities from your sites to your neighborhood, to your churches, as to how are people in your community? Are they not accepting of mental illness? Is it something that uh, really, you know, isn't dealt with well in your community? Whether, however you define your community. So, uh, we'll keep going. You can move the arrow around, Tanner, because we got to get going. Um, and we'll have Sherry listen to her video because she's going to talk from a very personal perspective and she's not alone. <coughs> Excuse me. Tanner, there's no sound. So when I went- Is that better, Crystal? You got it. Went to the okay. hospital, I did not know what to expect. And- Oh, we lost it, Tanner. And I Sorry. found that people did not call, people did not come by, people um, were afraid of what the hospital setting meant and how you access that part of the hospital. Um, and so 
it was it was lonely. It was a very lonely time. So I think you can see and and you can feel the hurt and the harm from the stigma and the isolation and being alone that uh, Sherry felt while she was in the hospital. It's very different from if someone has cancer and people are, how can we say, visiting, sending cards, passing cards around, let's say the classroom and everyone signing a card or maybe making posters for, for someone that has cancer. But Sherry's experience in, in the behavioral health unit was not that way and it was hurtful. So, you know, this stigma is powerful and it's painful and it, it really causes problems. Go ahead, Tanner. And again, we're looking at how does it show up in your community? And we, we're, we're going to keep going, even though if we were doing this in person, we'd have a, more of discussions and talking about it together. But for today, go back to enter one slide, we're gonna be talking about, uh, you're going the wrong direction, about how mental illness is treatable and recovery is possible. <clears throat> We know that through a variety of ways, whether it's uh, using medication, having therapy, diet, exercise, and you notice getting support helps people in their recovery. And you could kind of feel um, Sherry talking about she wasn't getting support and she, you know people weren't reaching out to her and it made her recovery much more difficult next slide tanner so we're going to be working on continuing to to learn how to support people and supporting each other those folks that have mental illness stopping that silence having the conversations just some very basic things that hopefully you're doing every day and being nice and listening and starting those conversations because yes, you're right. You know, there are lots of things about mental illness that we don't understand. It's very complicated, but we can still offer a hand to someone with mental illness to support them and have that have conversations about how they're doing just like you would do if someone had diabetes so go to the next slide and we'll listen to some hurtful language from dan so go ahead like a lot of people leaving with mental illness i i Unfortunately, I had to hear some hurtful language. I think one of the more common one in our society is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I was talking with someone and sharing the fact that you know I have a mental illness diagnosis, and the response was like, "No, you're not crazy, Dan." And I go, "I never said I was crazy. I said I have a mental illness diagnosis." And you know that association with the word crazy and mental illness is it's extremely tough. So Dan is kind of saying the how these powerful negative words impact people uh, with mental illness. So we'll keep going here, but we know that you all together we can figure out how to be more supportive and things not to say that aren't helpful, like, oh, just kind of snap out of it or pull yourself together. Uh, can you imagine saying some of those things to people that had cancer? What's wrong with you? Hey, just be happy. You know, those words are powerful and derogatory to persons with mental illness. And, you know, psycho or crazy, you know, it's, it's damaging and harmful. So the other part to this slide, and this is probably our most important slide, are things to think about saying 
just basic, how can I help? Is there anything I can do? Wow, that sounds really tough, you know? And, and even something, you know, as basic as asking about how can, how can I help you? It, it doesn't have to mean, you know, you're trying to be a psychologist or their counselor, even just listening and giving them a chance to kind of share from their perspective is most powerful. So it really comes down to the small conversations that you're doing together. So we'll keep going here. Um, and this is a, a slide to kind of emphasize what to say. My first hospitalization and treatment, I, I told just my supervisor, I didn't tell the leadership team that was around me. Um, and that was difficult because I knew I was hiding something and it didn't feel comfortable. It didn't feel comfortable leaving, being gone or coming back. And so the second time that I went in for um, hospitalization and then day treatment, I told the leadership team and I was nervous, <laughs> very nervous about doing that. And I was very fortunate that the team was very supportive and the way that they did that was that they normalized it for me. They didn't act afraid. They didn't act as if they didn't know what to do with me. Um, they very much just said, we wish you well. We understand you'll be out and we will help cover in whatever way that we can. And then with coworkers, I think it was very helpful when they would just um, check in every once in a while and just say, how are you doing today? And just that, that simple small bit makes a big difference because it just acknowledges that maybe things might not be going that great that day and that it's a struggle. You can, you can hear things that she was saying that, you know, the stigma was painful for her and by being open and able to talk about it helped her in her recovery. And we know that getting treatment saves lives. And so if we can reduce the stigma, you and I together can help people get treatment as we know recovery is possible. And yes, mental illness can go into remission that with depression, you can get treatment and you can recover. Uh, so there are very uh, different types of mental illness and they are treatable. There's medication. Unfortunately, some people don't wanna take their medics, medication prescribed by a doctor and they end up self-medicating i.e. alcohol or drugs, uh, illicit drugs. And the, if you want to know something to mess up your brain in an unhealthy way, though, though that's the, the route to go. So um, we'll keep working and having the conversations and working on stomping out that stigma in our community. So go ahead, Tanner. So I'm going to let Tanner kind of speak because I know many of you work uh, primarily with the high school and younger students, but Tanner's here talking about college students, but I think many of these points also are representative of uh, maybe the families, the parents that you're working with, or uh, some of the high school students I know are wrestling with a, a lot of stress and worry and anxiety. So I'm going to turn off my mic and let Tanner talk a little bit. Hello. Hello. Um, just want to first off say like I'm happy to give Mona a little break because she's been doing a lot for the presentation. But like she said, a lot of these issues don't just apply for college students like myself. It can also apply for high school students and just the young adults. So some of the major uh, mental health issues for for students is anxiety. 
and before COVID and even during COVID, this this uh, anxiety can happen through like through like amounts of homework, even studying for exams or even relationships. So COVID definitely played a huge impact into all these because we all had to settle into kind of a new way of learning, and so did the teachers. And you know, COVID kind of it could cause depression. It's common, common for students to, you know, get sad, especially during this time, whether it's, you know, for college students, you know, whether it's being homesick from living in a dorm or dealing with like a breakup or drama, or again, kind of dealing with large amounts of homework, which is something you're going to get as a student. And, you know, during COVID, it was hard to kind of to learn a new system of going online. It was definitely hard for me because I had to <clears throat> you know, learn from an online setting and not all my classes were doing that way. And some of them were just throwing homework at, at me. And it, it was definitely difficult. And during this time, sleeping disorder can be a main issue. Um, <clears throat> from falling asleep during the day, or just wanting to take a nap during, during the day, that's something, you know, normal for col college students, but it's, it doesn't help kind of staying up through the night and trying to like study for an exam or get a project done for work. And I also skipped one addiction, you know, for college students, you know, we're going to be experienced with, you know, alcohol or, or drugs. And, you know, some people will turn to this as like an escape to all like your uh, anxiety and depression, which it can lead to addiction, which, you know, will not help. And then of course, uh, stress is definitely a big, thing that's been going on for I think all students. I found that eight out, eight out of 10 college students deal with stress, but ever since COVID occurred, this pandemic, I do believe all students are dealing with stress. And this can be overwhelmed with schoolwork, trying to balance school and their jobs, not getting enough sleep, which is why you should you know get a lot of sleep and just not being organized. Definitely, I'd say stress was uh, impact on me trying to go to an online setting and you know I it was definitely difficult trying to learn on like zoom and just trying to look at some assignments and trying to figure it out without the teacher's help so it's it's definitely ever since COVID happened it's, it's definitely been really struggling however there are definitely ways to deal with like mental illness in school with your mental health he sorry health and one of the biggest things is like the make it okay <clears throat> uh, motto, stop the silence. You know, this can either like reach out the counseling resources. I know from Mount Mercy, they offered many counseling. They offered like counseling for like, if you're dealing with relation, like a tough relationship or during finals week, it's like, oh, if studying for finals is stressing you now, come here and we can kind of, you know, have fun and ignore it for a little bit. And so sometimes just talking about your problems can, can drastically reduce your stress. And you know, turning, turning the people, kind of telling them what's going on, that's gonna help you a lot. Another thing I found was you know, set, set goals. And this also connects with like be organized. Kind of decide like what you want to do to achieve, ac achieve academically and professional. Kind of decide like what you want to achieve in the week. Uh, for me, it's having like a daily planner. Like this helped me a lot during my time of college. My uh, first semester at college was not perfect. I got like a lot of assignments. I didn't turn them in on time. And it was kind of hard keeping track of all my work. And for example, one of my, uh, for a writing class, I, had, I got a B on my paper, but because I turned it in late because I didn't know when it was due, I actually got a C on it and that was, you know, pretty frustrating. So what I did was I <clears throat> got organized and I started like writing kind of like a daily planner. And it was like, this is what I'm going to do. This is uh, what I want to accomplish during the day. And that will ultimately like kind of help you feel accomplished of what you, what you've done. And obviously get plenty of sleep is another great way. I found like try to get at least maybe seven hours of sleep. Don't definitely do not do all nighters. I've I've done that before. Not definitely not a great idea. Just getting getting enough sleep can 
can actually improve your concentration and productivity. And you know, when I when I did an all nighter trying to study for an exam, it just made me more tired through the day, and I wasn't completely focused during my exam, which I ultimately failed. So kind of staying up all night trying to get like an assignment done or try to study an exam is not a great way of doing it. <clears throat> for students, the best way to deal with kind of your mental illness is just having a stress outlet. This can include like social activities with friends. For me during COVID, it was again, like hang out with friends, playing video games. Before COVID, it was participating in school clubs. I was part of the music department at Mount Mercy, which really helped, helped me. It you know, made me excited like to wake up every day for school. And just trying to find a hobby, something that you enjoy and surround yourself with family and friends. So all of this definitely, it's not just for college students, it's for just anyone like young adults and <clears throat> the work environment. So Mona, you can. Yep. You're muted, Mona. Okay. Can you go back to that slide, Tanner? Because the one with the bullet points, not that one, the one where you were talking about getting sleep, having organization, talking about it, those, he, you're going the wrong direction. Those slides, that those bullet points really represent what you need to do to take care of yourself because for you at your sites and working with the families and dealing with COVID, you know, those simple steps to have a routine to get enough sleep. So when you go on the job site, that you're the best person you can be on that day. And, and I'm not saying we're not trying to make you into a psychologist or a counselor, but just walk the talk and model it for the students and the families that you're working with. You know, it's really important to get up every day at the same time, to go to bed, to get good sleep. So all of those things, which you know, probably in your heart, uh, but sometimes we just get distracted and we forget. So we're really running out of time here and I don't want to, um, spend too much of, of our precious moments, but you can go online, you can take the Make It Okay pledge, keep going, Tanner. Um, all of these resources are at the makeitokay.org Iowa. You can ask for a speaker to come and talk to your site to your principals or teachers. Uh, you can become an ambassador. And I saw someone had a question about how to do that and were there any in her community. And I'd be happy to follow up with you. We're also doing things in the workplace for employers and employees. So I consider your site a, a workplace to keep you guys healthy. You've heard a little bit about making it okay, but we also want to not just make it okay for uh, the students and families, but we want to make it okay for you too. So we'll keep going, Tanner. Uh, the next slide is resources. These are some that you can have available. They're on the Iowa website. They're on the NAMI website. There's chat lines. We have a brochure about where to turn. Um, in your county, there may be some local resources. Here in Lynn County, there are several different agencies. And there's nothing wrong with calling 911 if your gut says you're concerned and you need a welfare check on a family because everything says red lights there something's not right here and it's very dangerous you know save a life do what you need to do and i think we just have one or two more tanner can you we're almost out of time so um we'll watch this um and then we'll stop the slides after this one a few years Years ago, I lost a job because of stigma. Stigma, it prevented me from getting employment. It prevented me from maintaining jobs. I've lost a lot of good friends uh, 
due to stigma. Stigma made me hide my truth and who I really am. It kept me feeling isolated and just resulted in more loneliness and more opportunity for the illness to continue rather than get better. Stigma for me made it very difficult to even access services when I first experienced mental illness. Stigma has made me feel more alone and like I couldn't connect with anyone. Thank you for taking this time to, to educate yourselves and, and learn more. I appreciate anybody who opens their mind and heart to learning more about mental illness and taking the power away from stigma. And without your help, we, we can't completely eradicate the discrimination that people living with mental illness and their family members experience. I really want to thank you for taking an interest in this and doing this activity, and I hope that that will help others to experience less of that stigma. I really appreciate that you are taking the time to look within yourself and to think about how stigma does affect someone with a mental illness and how you can help be a part of a solution towards making it easier for someone to access the help that they need. Well, I really appreciate you taking the first step to end this stigma. Thank you for reflecting on the impact of stigma. I want to thank you for making it so that anyone else doesn't have to feel alone and that they know that someone cares for them. So we just have a few minutes here and I would like to respond quickly to some of the questions. You can look at the thought bubble, but in terms of COVID-19 um, and the questions from uh, Carlson where she's asking us about, or he, about mental illness being increased during these times. As, as a psychologist in working with the various mental health agencies, they're having what they call a mental health tsunami. We're seeing more and more problems that were hidden because people were isolated at home. And we're hearing more stories about addiction and depression uh, for people who uh, we lost contact with. And I ha I'm having friends call me about they're so anxious and they're describing having a panic attack and they've never experienced it before. And they can't, you know, being home and, you know, dealing with the economic uncertainty and all of those things really are, how can we say, causing an exacerbation in creating mental illnesses in our environment. So I believe that you will be seeing and hearing more about it from your students and the families. And in the Make It Okay, we are going out into the high schools and the colleges with specific presentations from peer to peer. Um, we're, we're having toolkits that we could share with Crystal, or you can go online where you can hand out to families or students that describe kind of step-by-step step what to do and how to make it okay. We also have revised our posters so that they show a younger elementary students and their teachers kind of interacting and and you know they have bullets like uh, that specifically target the younger population and now we're getting some poster material for high school and above so we do have resources and you can directly access that at makeitok.org slash Iowa um, also so you know it, even if you go to nami.iowa uh, and you type in uh, students and looking for resources, they have the NAMI on campus, they have the NAMI on high school. So you're not alone that we can help you strengthen and stop the stigma at your sites and in your community and using resources is a great step so that, that i hope i answered your question so you can tell me yay or nay um, there was also another question a little more difficult one and i'm not sure i can answer it in a minute but I'm, I'm a, do i have enough time crystal to talk about the hopelessness helplessness question 
from Jenny about someone who's completely given up. So I mm, absolutely okay. Um, you know, that's a toughie and and I won't try to soft shoe it any other way. Um, we do know that with me mental illness, bad habits can be set in place. And there's a type of sort of like thinking called learned helplessness, sort of like the more you're down, the more it sort of self perpetuates and you are almost having a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy where you feel you're no good and so no good things happen to you. It's, it's kind of like if you put on dark sunglasses and you wore them for five years or maybe 10 years, over time, that's how you would view your world. So this person that you're referencing who has no job, Jenny, no family support or friends that have completely withdrawn, what do you do? Um, and they, they are getting the right, supposedly lots of love and treatment. I still think that uh, maybe a different doctor or a different therapist to try something different. It's kind of like in school, you know, maybe with your particular teacher, you don't jive. Um, over time, it gets kind of stale and you need a fresh approach. So I would say in regards to this case of someone who's not seeking help would be really to have more conversations and and trying to have them to take steps you know hey i heard there's this new doctor or this doctor or this person that might be able you know that could be help you um so to be as supportive and caring and and really just keeping that conversation going you know because what they're doing is um you know wearing those dark sunglasses and you want to help them take them off and maybe they're afraid. So I, 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 I will try to wrap up now because I can see people have to go, but I'm very grateful to Crystal and for all of you giving us, Jenner and I, this opportunity. And thank you for your feedback. I think Crystal's going to send out a survey monkey so we can kind of get your thoughts. And I would be more than happy to come to your sites virtually and do such a similar presentation with to your families or to your teachers or whatever your, however you define your community. So thank you very much. I appreciate all that you're doing and listening to make it okay. Thank you so much for the presentation today. We hope that this was valuable for people to hear. Uh, if you give us a little bit of time, we will certainly upload the recording to the website. We'll also make available the, um, on our website, we'll connect the link to uh, Make It Okay Iowa that we talked about, and then also um, any other additional links or pieces of information that might be beneficial for people today. I did take your questions out of the chat and I've simply dropped them into a Word document. I'll be sending those out uh, today to uh, Dr. Witters and Tanner so that they can have some time to spend with them and maybe answer things uh, a little more thoroughly since we were a little rushed on time at the end here. And then we'll go ahead and make those available to everybody as well. Again, I want to thank everybody for your participation today. If you have further questions, if you know, in 30 minutes from now, you're like, oh, I wish I would have asked that. Uh, please don't hesitate to send that my way. And we'll make all attempts to get those uh, asked and answered then for you. So with that being said, I want to thank everybody. I'm going to stop the recording and I wish you all a good day.